Nearly 700,000 jobs have been lost since the start of lockdown, according to the Office for National Statistics, as despite fresh hiring as the economy reopens. More losses are expected in the coming weeks as the government's job retention or furlough scheme ends in October. Joining me now is Employment Minister Mims Davis. Minister, good to have you back on the programme. What are you saying to those who are out of work because of the pandemic? Yeah, hi Nick. It's obviously been a mixed picture today with uh, employment ticking up, unemployment ticking up to, to about 4.1%. Some bright spots with an increase of vacancies around 60,000. But as you say, the RTI da data uh, from when we were in the, the peak of the pandemic uh, showing the impact of that handbrake on, on our economy. So what I'm saying to people is that we are absolutely uh, ready to help people uh, on their next stage of employment. So we've got our plan for jobs, which is being enacted right now. So some of that people might have seen is our new kickstart scheme, which is a £2 billion programme to support our young people into work. And there'll be further interventions coming from DWP over the coming month. You say you're ready to step in. Surely these figures say now is the time. Well, we're absolutely helping our claimants uh, every every day and people job seeking with about 250,000 calls a week uh, to people on our books. And we're getting involved with what people are looking to do or maybe go back to or supporting people through uh, keeping the, the minimum income floor uh, from being uh, put back in if you're self-employed. So it means that you can get back on your feet. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to help people. As I say, the new kickstart scheme is for under 25 it's 25 hours a week funded by the government to bring somebody into your business uh, to, to try and help you restart and grow and give somebody a chance to get onto that employment ladder or indeed some of our, our larger businesses who are looking to take people on are really keen to, to look at younger people in a way that perhaps they might not have without kickstart we know the impact of the pandemic is more likely to have an impact on young people without the the skills and the ability and the network to get into work so we at DWP working with the Treasury to get those people into roles and that's already happened from November. It's good to focus on young people but obviously this is a, a series of job losses that are being felt in other age groups as well. What action are you taking about them? Yeah, we're working with our uh, job centres and we're delighted to be recruiting ourselves so if it's something that you would like to be doing in your local community uh, have a look at gov.uk work coach uh, and find out if your area is recruiting some already now and some over the coming weeks uh, so we're definitely attracting people to DWP to help change lives which is brilliant and we're going to be doubling the number of our work coaches to, to help people to understand what their skills and abilities and interests are and maybe pivot into some of those growing sectors I was talking to some of our SME groups earlier today from the tech industry and the care industry making no secret they were about the amount of vacancies and opportunities they have so we need to get people into those sectors and that's where we use our sector-based work academy program so if you're on universal credit you're one of our claimants it's a chance to interview and learn the skills needed for a particular sector there are vacancies there you interview at the end of it and we are seeing people moving into those roles I recently saw people from a retail background uh, with logistical background moving into construction in our uh, in our Kennington job center so these are happening up and down the country I would say our job centers are open they've continued to be open through throughout the, the pandemic for the most vulnerable people, but we've got them open and COVID safe so we can meet people face to face to see what barriers are and what support they need. Well, as you say, this is something that's happening across the country and the pain of losing your job isn't going to be felt equally geographically. If it's not so easy to get a new one, I'm thinking in terms of coastal towns, former industrial areas, the Midlands, South Wales, mm -hmm. even West Scotland, they're predicted to be the hardest hit by these job losses. What should people in those areas be doing? Well, I think what we're doing with our local and national partnerships teams and working uh, on local recovery plans with our DWP teams means that they're working with the local councils, the LEPs, all the business groups to know where the opportunities are and where the challenges are. And let me give you an example of how we're using innovation to try and help people where sectors are not doing so well to try and support sectors where are growing. So uh, in Buckinghamshire uh, and with the M3 LEP and the Buckinghamshire LEP, we're working 
work in with Pinewood and the local film studios to help people who've got an aviation background pivot into a growing sector. So they need accountants, they need set decorators, they need all sorts of people in this sector and we know people nearby are affected by the, the uh, decline of the travel and tourism. And, but, um, but isn't, uh, I mean, you mentioned Buckinghamshire, isn't that the issue hmm. that if you're in the south of the UK, particularly the southeast, you're going to have a much easier time finding work than if you're elsewhere in the country? Well, actually, if you look at the furlough scheme, uh, for example, Crawley has been very affected by the aviation and the tourism sector. And so I wouldn't say it's necessarily those particular areas that we'd normally think of. Uh, so that's why the Eat Out to Help Out scheme for the hospitality sector, for example, has been really important to get people positively back going out to, to eat and enjoying their local surroundings. And I know, for example, in the southwest, where it's tourism driven, hospitality driven, this has made a, a massive impact and that's why that that reduction from the chancellor has really been important I've been talking with my fellow ministers so uh, hs2 for example needs over uh, 30,000 people coming into the construction industry so we just need to make people understand where they need to maybe upskill pivot learn new uh, new learn new interest and, and go for it who would ever have thought you could go from the aviation industry to the industry but it's possible the Chancellor says he won't be extending the furlough scheme when it runs out next month. Given your government's previous U-turns, should we believe him? I think the opportunity the Chancellor has with, a, with an autumn budget is to start to look at the sectors and then the interventions that, that he might need to do to, to create sectoral support. Uh, but we've already been doing it. We've seen the uh, stamp duty change, which has seen the house buying sector grow. I've mentioned Eat Out to help out the VAT reduction, the business rates reduction. So we've been using every tool. I don't think uh, he uh, he's a Chancellor so he'll find all the tools he needs for the sectors he needs as we go into the autumn we start to see what furlough unwinding means but we've certainly seen in these job figures today from the ONS many people are returning to their roles and also that job retention bonus is helping so for me keeping people long term in what's been termed suspended animation waiting for their sector to come back long term isn't the right thing to do that's why we've got this plan for jobs it's a 30 billion pounds intervention including that two billion pounds for kickstart We've got coming up something soon, our new job finding support, which is going to be a more digital support here at DWP. And we're uh, going to be working also with the recruitment industry to try and help our work coaches uh, to get more support as their uh, caseload is growing. So we're using lots of interventions. The furlough is just one of them. Now, another factor that will be affecting business and jobs is obviously a Brexit deal. Last night, you voted for the Internal Markets Bill, which the Prime Minister says is needed to strengthen the agreement with the EU that he negotiated last year. What's wrong with that deal? I think what we started to do last night is only the, the second reading. We're going into committee stages uh, and all MPs from all parties uh, will be able to, to make their case about what they need to know and understand regarding the internal markets bill. And, you know, this is to make sure that from January uh, that we are able to support the, the United Kingdom to, to work and function as we uh, finally set uh, forward on, the, you know, 45 years on plus uh, from being fully out of the EU. And we've seen the benefits uh, that being there with the £15 billion deal that we've got uh, sure, Japan, sure, but, but that point, which is that uh, you defended, you voted for the um, deal um, that the Prime Minister negotiated last year, uh, and now he's saying that he requires this additional bill to strengthen that deal. I, I was just wondering what changed your mind about the, the deal that he negotiated last year? So this is about an insurance policy, and let's take this back to jobs, livelihoods and businesses, so that come January, if we aren't in a position that we've got a free trade deal, similar to what we've just achieved with, with Japan, uh, with the EU, a kind of Canada plus style deal, that we can give that certainty to our businesses and to, to our nation so that we can trade and support others to go but forward. when so we, we were think... speaking last year, that was what that um, deal was meant to do. I think you yourself said that this was an opportunity to move on from Brexit because it was all within that deal. The Northern Ireland Protocol particularly was a case of effectively solving it. That, that was how it was framed to us, the, the people of the UK. So 
by, by October the, the 15th, by the time that the next time that the EU and we meet, it would be great for us to have that deal. If we don't, this is our insurance policy about what happens next. The Prime Minister said yesterday in the chamber, and I, I've said previously, nobody wants to be in this situation. We want to be in a free trade arrangement, and that's what we're striving for. There's much more in this bill uh, than just that. This is absolutely right that the government takes a, a pragmatic view about something that you know we might not have been able to achieve by January but uh, the Prime Minister again yesterday pointed out that we are using every sinew to get that good future trading relationship with the EU now I think we all want that with the backdrop of the pandemic for all our nations and all our trading opportunities we've been able to achieve something brilliant with Japan. I know that Canada and uh, other potential deals with the USA are waiting in the wings. So we need to make sure that we get that good trading arrangement with the EU. And I think it's in the interest as well. But it was the Prime Minister and his negotiation team led by Lord Frost who negotiated the deal last year with the European Union. What makes you so confident if they made errors in that deal that have to be rectified now that they won't make errors in the future trade deals? So, so this is a negotiation and we're, we're heading up to the to the meat and drink of it as we're you know heading towards the running out of time and we need to have a plan come January about how we will move forward if we can't achieve that as I say it's in our EU in the EU's uh, interest as our friends and partners to, to find something that works for everybody with the backdrop of the pandemic and Government has to be pragmatic when things change. And this pragmatic But what had changed? What's changed? That was my question. Well, at the moment, that, that we haven't got that free trading agreement and we're striving really hard for that. Uh, and it's, you know, you can hear all the noise coming out of the negotiations. It's still, you know, a few more things to iron out, but we have come a long way. And my uh, government is doing everything that we can to get that free trading arrangement so that come January that we can support local businesses and local livelihoods this is about jobs and livelihoods for the united kingdom in which case how likely how likely do you think that deal is then with the eu i think there's a need for all of us to come together to give certainties to our communities and i certainly but how likely do you think it is well i was with the g20 last week and it was really positive meeting it's a simple question how likely do you think it is to get that deal with the eu by the end of the year I was going to say it was a really positive meeting of all employment ministers about what certainty we need to give uh, ourselves uh, to get on to the next stage of recovery through this pandemic. The EU needs to give that certainty to themselves as much as we do. This is a negotiation. I doubt it won't go down to the wire. These things often do, but it's absolutely pragmatic that we plan for, for what are all eventualities that could come in January. So... How likely do you think that deal with the European Union is by the end of the year? Well, we really need to get this ironed out by October, and that's why we've got the internal markets bill. And I think the more that we plan for not having that agreement means that we're more likely to get one. And I think that that is a sensible decision by the government. Does that make sense? What planning? We've seen, obviously, the the rise in rhetoric this week uh, with some experts saying that this deal... Oh, with this bill actually makes it less likely to get a deal with the European Union, but you think it makes it more likely? We have been using our business continuity plans from No Deal for for the pandemic, which has really helped us as a government and as a department to to plan. And it's absolutely right that we plan for all scenarios. The Prime Minister made it clear yesterday he is determined to do everything we can to get that deal. That's what our negotiation teams are tasked to do. I wish them all the luck in the world. I think it's very likely because the EU need a deal as much as we do. I think perhaps we were talking at cross purposes there, but uh, a final question, Minister, returning to those jobs figures and based on exactly what we've been speaking about, will we be ending the year with more people out of work than perhaps we were last year? 
I think it's fair to say that we're in for a bumpy ride and people are worried about their, their livelihoods. We know that our consumption is increasing and we are a economy based on consumption and that's that's good news that it's improving. We know that some sectors are coming back faster than others, but we know that the pandemic is having a longer tail in other sectors, which is challenging. But we have to remember last January when we came into this pandemic, uh, uh, we were at the highest employment levels. We had made great strides in getting women into work, getting people from all different backgrounds with any disablement or health conditions into work. And I am determined that despite this pandemic outcome, that we push really hard to get back into that place and use all the tools that we can to get into a greener recovery, build back better and stronger with more resilience and also fix some of those structural problems in the economy around the care industry, construction, green jobs, or indeed digital, to make sure that people have those opportunities and that hope for the future. A final question, Minister. You mentioned that you've just come from the, the G20 meeting with other employment ministers. Are there any lessons that you'll be taking back to Cabinet from how other countries have handled employment in the pandemic? Well, I think other countries were really interested in what we were doing and certainly the fact that we've had a very a comprehensive package as a whole, £160 billion, including now the £30 billion for uh, for for job, billion pounds for the plan for jobs and the kickstart scheme. They were particularly interested in the kickstart scheme. And we know that coming into this pandemic, other countries already had a, a bigger problem with youth unemployment already. So people looking very much at us and we're absolutely learning from, from our colleagues. So that is a really important place for us to share uh, what we need to do to, to learn and understand from each other. But I would certainly say that we should have confidence because many people are continuing to listen to us. Minister, thank you for your time. That's Employment Minister Mims Davis.